Tuesday, four games, a lot of them close, some interesting performances. Let's break them all down for fantasy basketball, Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I might have to take uh, a couple of podcasts off on being managed with hamstring soreness. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore beeble, on TikTok at redrock underscore beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. We're available on all platforms. YouTube legends, 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 legends. Haven't done many of these shows. Thumb it up, leave your comments below, ring the bell, subscribe on audio, double bang. Or if you're on video, you double bang as well. We're all double bang all all the time. That's all we do. So go and do that and help the show out as we dwindle the amount of days left. We dwindle? I don't think we can dwindle, can we? No, we can't. We can't dwindle. Anyway, that's fine. The days are rolling down. They're getting smaller and smaller, the amount of days left in this regular season. And my waffling is going on and on. We're talking about the games from Tuesday, March the 26th. There were the four of them on, but let's just do a quick little news update. The first bit of news we're going to talk about is whatever it is that's going on with Portland and with um, uh, Utah. So let's start with Utah. We saw that they were taking on the Spurs tomorrow. And then wouldn't you know it, out of nowhere, unbelievable coincidence, Jordan Clarkson suffered another injury, another one, not the groin, but the back this time, back soreness, so he's out, and Larry Markkinen, after being fined to play the last game, well, that quad, it's just giving him too many difficulties, it's just too hard to go, so he's questionable, and I can almost assure you that that questionable means out, as for the Spurs, both Victor Wembanyama and Keldon Johnson are on the injury report as questionable, wow, I wonder if they play. What an interesting, interesting, annoying game that is going to be. As for Portland, the Ides of March legend, Jeremy Grant, is once again doubtful. This man has never met a March game that he didn't sit out. The hamstring continues to be a problem. The doubtful tag continues to be an absolute thorn in my side. Or, should I do it? Should I say it? Or as Borat would say, a pain in my assholes. Yeah, annoying. Jeremy Grant, doubtful. Wow, shocking. Um, Aiton is questionable. He's missed three straight with the questionable elbow tendonitis. Tendonitis, one of the key tank resting terms you will see. And then Anthony Simons, who is out again. He was listed questionable for Monday's game. He was out that one. He's out on Saturday. He's out on Wednesday. And I believe that he will be out for the season. I don't know that. That has not been decided. That is not official. That has not been decided. But I have been in given information to suggest that that's probably going to be the case. Now, it's always going to be a risk to drop someone like Simons, but I think you should work under the assumption that he's probably not going to play. He's out again here. Out of nowhere, DeJounte Murray popped up on the injury report. We know that Okongwu's out, Jalen's out, Trey's out. Now, DeJounte's popped up with back soreness. Now, they're not tanking, are they? Well, they're not going anywhere. They're in their slot in the plan. They're not losing their spots. I don't really know what's going on there. If he is out, then I honestly have no idea what they do. It might be Trent Forrest time because I don't have any other guards. So yeah, just keep an eye on that one. But that did, just did pop up. While the Pistons, Cade Cunningham, the knee injury management, he's questionable. He's missed the last two. I would have to suggest that he's unlikely to play, but I don't know. But then out of nowhere, Jalen Duran is back and playing. Okay, I th- we thought he might be done too. The probable tag. But as we've seen many times, shout out to the Wizards and Kyle Kuzma, Denny Avdia, who are off the injury report, doesn't mean they're playing. We've seen plenty of teams issue fraudulent injury reports. Fraudulent sounds very aggressive. Fake, incomplete, um, forgetful injury reports where someone like Duran, who's now probable, he might just have a, a terrible night. Maybe he borrowed the snowman's um, air mattress and slept on it and just wakes up really sore. We don't know. We have to, we have to, don't have to go by their word. We have to at least listen to their word saying he's probable, but we don't know, do we? And then the Phoenix guys, both Brad Beal with a finger sprain and Yusuf Nurkic with an ankle sprain, they're li- officially listed questionable. They didn't practice. There's almost no way they're questionable to me. I don't think there's any chance they're questionable, but I don't know. 
they're listing them that way. They're playing the Nuggets, who have got their own injury issues. Maga Porter and Nikola Jokic are both probable. The headmaster and Aaron Gordon are both questionable. So I, I don't know. I would have to say that Beal and Nurkic aren't going to play, but I don't know. I definitely wouldn't take the risk of adding a Royce O'Neal or a Drew Eubanks for a 12-game Wednesday when they've got one more game this week. But I'd be very much prepared for Beal and Nurkic not to be available. I think that's where we're at. Let's look at some waiver wire trends. Who's been added? Who's been dropped over the last 24 hours since I last talked about this part of it? Um, most added player, Najee Marshall, up 37%. A lot of leagues adding Najee for the three quality games this week. Cool. We'll talk about that later. Bitcoin legend, Spencer Didwitty, up 18%. Is that the reverse um, growth trend for Dogecoin? I don't know. But Didwitty started again with LeBron out. We'll talk about that later on. You don't want to hold him. Uh, Rashawn Holmes up 14%. The last game, massively encouraging. I still am on um, really sort of walking on a fine line as to whether he's going to maintain that. I'm on tender hooks about whether Holmes can keep this up because I think at any point we could see Vukcevic or we could even see Bagley step back in, but I don't know. But for now, Holmes is solid enough. Rui Hachimura up 11%. Well, that is obviously just to get the game in today. Uh, Leaky Beasley, three quality games, up 9%. Love it. And then 44-minute legend, Juice McBride. Up 9%. Yeah, you'd add him. You'd roster him until at least OG's coming back. Not happening this week. So Juice is going to be uh, pretty okay, I'd say. Who are the most drop players? It is number one. Get that garbage out of here. John Armstrong says Aaron Neesmith's down at 12%. True. Neesmith and TJ McConnell are both questionable tomorrow. Neesmith won a, with a Wednesday game and only a Friday game. And he's not that good. Move on. Uh, Cam Johnson out again. Drop him. Vasily Misic down 8%. Last game was really poor. I'm guessing a lot of that is points league related. A lot of people do make reaction reactionary moves, reactive moves, because someone scores low points. He still had four assists, which is not awesome, but like it's above average. But if you score a lot or you score little in the points category, you can often be added and dropped by some people going a little bit too hard. I've got, if you want to drop Misic, that's totally okay. I'm not sure I would have been super into it, though. I'm not, not massively right in that one. Trace Jackson Davis down 7%. He had a great opportunity today. Didn't play. I think he plays tomorrow. And honestly, on high volume days, I think Jackson Davis is actually going to be startable for you. Necro Kongwu down 6%. Cool. We just don't know when he's coming back. Although the Hawks have got an unbelievably good schedule. After Wednesday's game, their next, next six games are all quality games. Best schedule in the NBA. So if he does come back, then we're definitely grabbing him. And Grant Williams down 6%. Which is fine because Grant Williams is, as the kids would say, not good. Today's episode is brought to you by the old eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. That is what brings home the winning trophy. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and to level it up to peak performance from superchargers and roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber and not cash. With all the parts that you need at the prices you want, it is easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. An eBay guaranteed fit is only available to US customers. All right, we are going to get into the games. The first game was the Golden State Warriors and the Miami Heat. I said in the intro there were some close games. This was not one of them. The Warriors added Clay Thompson back to the starting lineup while Brandon Pajemski moved back to the bench while March MVP legend Jimmy Butler was out with an illness. So hottest 100 legend Jaime Huckers Jr., moved into the starting lineup. The Heat were without a million other guys as well. The Warriors smashed them. 113-92 was the final score here. Um, yeah, so like, as for, well, let's just start with Pajemski, who was pretty poor the game before that. He's been getting squeezed with minutes and he played, what, 22 here for six points. You can jack him off. Get that garbage out of here. It's always worth just getting something in if he's on your roster on a low-volume day like this, but move on. Chris Paul, we're getting pretty close to the to a jack here. Zero points. The seven assists are useful. The two steals are useful. He's 147th over the last two weeks. He's playing 23 minutes a night, Chris Paul. Um, look, for a lot of you, getting seven assists a night is um, unbelievably useful. But look at what your matchup is. Are you smashing in assists? Are you getting killed in assists? 
Because if you don't need him, what are you doing with him? There's no reason to have Chris Paul on your roster given the minutes he's getting. Clay Thompson, very good game. 31 minutes, 28 and 5 with six triples. Love that. He's on a nice little hot streak at the moment. Realistically, he is a points and threes guy. And when the shots go in, it's much better, obviously, like this. Well, Andy Wiggins had 17 and 7. He had two blocks. He shot well, 31 minutes. I'm not fully in on Wigo. Like, they've got the high volume games now the rest of the week. Would you even start Wiggins on those days? I would suggest probably not. But that's a better game. Or Draymond had 4, 9, and 8. And Kaminga who have been also sort of tumbling down a little bit. This is a better game, 18-7-3 with a block. As I said, there was no um, Trace Jackson Davis, so they dusted off Kevon Looney. He had 7-6 and six in 19 minutes, and yes, we are absolutely not doing anything with that. For the Miami Heat, there was no Butler. There was no Hero. There was no Robinson. There was no Kevin Love. So we did get Jaime Jaquez starting. He played 26 minutes. He had 12 points on 40%. He was a team worst, minus 24. He got cooked, so his minutes were low, and he has been absolutely dreadful. The 299th ranked player over the last two weeks after that unbelievably hot start to the season. He has been unrosterable for three months and you, he is still rostered in 53% of 12-team leagues. Please stop doing that. Obviously, there's value in doing that on a day like today, but you know, long-term, absolutely not. Hayward Highsmith, out of the rotation legend, jumps up with 30 minutes off the bench, 15 and 6, two steals, three threes. But of course, if Butler, Hero, Robinson and Love all play or if two of those guys play, Highsmith might not touch the court. So I'm not reacting to that. And then after two sub-20 minute games, Caleb Martin played 34. He had 10, 5, and 6, which is like, that's the Kyle Anderson without defense. That's okay, but I definitely don't care to add him and use him. Bam at a bio, a whack in the head. He was able to return to the game. Hopefully no delayed concussion here. 24, 9, 5 assists, steal block 3. Good numbers right across the board for him. Well, we also got 31 minutes out of Little Chungus. Nikola Jovic had 11, 6, and 4 on 36%. Now that's okay, because he was gifted the 30 minutes here with a lot of guys out. The numbers are fine. They're not great. I definitely wouldn't be interested in adding him. While speaking of not interested, Terry Rozier, this man continues to really struggle. I do think he's going to be better than this eventually. I had him on the positive trend show earlier today. But bloody hell, 15, 4, and 2, 39%. It has been really disastrous since he joined Miami for his value. While uh, Pat Mills, two points in 18 minutes in a start for the big fella, Dunkey Robinson. The next game. What a ridiculous game, this one, between the Lakers and the Milwaukee Bucks. There was a change uh, in the lineups here because LeBron was out with that ankle problem and D'Angelo Russell, who missed the last game with an illness, he just slotted back in and took LeBron's spot in the starting lineup. But that is not the story of this game. The story of this game is the fact that this one went to double overtime and the Lakers, who were down huge early on, like 15, 17 points, I think, in the first half, they end up winning it 128-124 with no LeBron. You would have to um, you would have to doubt, given the minutes that Anthony Davis saw in this one, 52 of them, that there is against the Grizzlies tomorrow that he does not play. You would have to think there's a pretty ch- – especially he was at the end of the game, you're sort of grabbing his hip funny. You would have to think there is a chance he does not play in that game. Uh, whether LeBron returns or not, I'm not sure. I think he probably does, but maybe not necessarily. AD had 34 and 22. Just a quick hint as to who might be the monstrous line of the night. 34 and 22 with three threes. That's almost the biggest surprise out of all of this. Two steals, four blocks. He only shot 39%, which sucks. But he took a million shots and he really stepped up without LeBron, as did sick legend, infirmary legend, D'Angelo Russell. 50 minutes, 29, 7 and 12, two steals and a block. He also shot poorly, but he got to the line 10 times. And Austin Reeves, a casual 48-minute triple-double. 29, 14 and 10 with two blocks. These guys did nearly all of the damage, but my mate, Rui Hachimura did chime in with 16 and 14, and that is pretty good without LeBron. That's a pretty good game from Rui. Spencer Dinwiddie, he, um, yeah, the fall was not particularly kind to him. 42 minutes for seven points, four assists on 13%. We had the one good game out of Spence. People rushed to grab him because LeBron was out, and I get it because he is someone who was going to play decent minutes in a game a day with only four games on, so it made sense. He just didn't work out because he has been bad in literally every single game apart from that last one. On Sunday. That's cool. Torian Prince had nine points in 28 minutes for um, the artist there. Nothing to write home about. And that's all we're really going to talk about with the Lakers, I think. On to the Bucks. Uh, Apple a Day Legends. Yanni had 46 minutes. He had 29, 21, 11, two seals, three blocks. Unbelievably one of six from the line. So that's just a brutal, brutal free throw hit. And 56 from the field. While Punchbob played 30 minutes, Bobby Portis. 18 and 13. Let's look to Brook Lopez. Does he continue to really struggle? Like, yeah, a little bit. 9 and 6, 33 minutes, no blocks. We're not dropping him because of the Bucks' schedule, but 
He's not playing well, is he? Leaky Beasley, 40 minutes, 21 and 5, threes, three rebounds, steal, block, two more qualities left this week. You added Leaky because of the schedule and you got something really good out of it. So just enjoy that for the rest of the week. How did Damian Lillard's field goal percentage look? Not good. 27 on 31%. He played 49 minutes. He had eight assists. He hit three threes. But the field goals have been a huge, a huge bugbear all season. While Christopher Middleton, his name's not Christopher, it's Christian. James Christian Middleton played 39 minutes. I think he only played 14 first half minutes, but loaded up in the second half. 12, 6, and 7. And there's just another brutal shooting night for Middleton, who I think shot 20 odd percent in the game on Sunday. But he got the seven assists, and we just love that he's out there playing. As for the other spuds, Paddy Connaughton had three points in 22 minutes. Jay Crowder is absolutely, in fact, I haven't done this for um, for Jay, but I'm pretty sure he deserves it for all the nonsense he's given us over the years. Jay Crowder. Um, he had five points in 18 minutes. I just realized now that in the Warriors game, I didn't even talk about Steph. I just quickly mentioned Steph because he had 17 points on 47%. He's 44th ranked player over the last two weeks. And he has been an underrated or under-talked about Huge disappointment this season. Like a massive fantasy disappointment. He has been a way worse disappointment than Damian Lillard. Drafted earlier, finished behind him or finishing behind him. He's been terrible. Anyway, terrible, relatively terrible, Steph. Relative. It's a relativity based on draft slot and where you finish now. Um, yeah, not much else to talk about there with the Buckaroos, I don't think. Yep, I think that will uh, that will take us to completion in that game. We've got two more to go. But today's episode... Is also brought to you by Better Help. Sometimes you need that opportunity to get something off your chest. Big or small, certain things can impact your life in ways that sometimes you don't even know about. But you just want to vent. You want to get that stuff out to somebody in your life who is unbiased. So today, I want to tell you something. That's what I feel. What is getting on my nerves? Well, there's always something. Let me tell you what one of them is. It's Yahoo's injury list policy. The seven-day policy that they don't apply seven days all the time and then relays or waits. We have to wait for somebody's subjective decision as to whether someone becomes eligible and they just refuse to listen to me making their life easier and removing it from their system and having IL plus only. It's annoying. But like, can I vent, vent with that to anybody? Talk to my partner about that. Because shut up. I'm, very, I'm a very busy person. I'm a very important person. I can't hear you talk about injured list. That, that's a lie. She'll listen. But... If you want to get stuff off your chest that might seem inconsequential, well, therapy can do that. It can be different for everyone. We all have bigger problems than injury lists and our favorite sports teams or fantasy teams underperforming. But getting stuff off your chest every once in a while is key. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off your first month. That is betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on NBA. Look at this one thing, sidebar. We haven't done a real official sidebar for a while, but let's do one now. One thing I've really learned in doing this podcast for, how many episodes do you reckon I've done? Not including um, pregame show live streams. Let's have a look at the actual number. I'm pretty sure this number's not even right, but let's have a look. The We are at, this is the 4,232nd episode of this podcast. Doing this podcast for that long, that many episodes, again, not including the probably seven or 800 pregame shows, which takes us over 5,000, my ability to project my voice and really push it out is something I never used to do. If you go listen to some of the old shows on YouTube, it's me going, yeah, so the Bucks and the Lakers, yeah, pretty good game here. Not, not a bad result. Uh, LeBron missing and Anthony Davis play 52 minutes. Um, but now, I don't know, I'm really just projection. Makes you feel like I'm strong, but I'm not. But anyway, I'm projecting my voice. Third game. Who was it? Thunder. Pelicans. Yeah, it was. Was there any lineup changes in this one? Absolutely not. But let's go and have a look at it because it was another relatively close game. The Thunder, 119. The Pelicans, 112. Josh Giddy, what is going on with this bloke? 31 minutes, 25, 9 and 4, 5 triples, 71%. You know what's going to be absolutely wild is he's going to end the season somehow as a top 100 player and he's going to end the fantasy playoffs as a guy returning the exact same value as to where he's drafted. I don't know what's happening. I don't know why he's first. Maybe I do. Maybe there was a certain incident that was spread through social media that may have caused a distraction for him and um, made him play like trash for three months. That's possible. But now he is rolling. He hit five threes in this game. Big minutes, big production. Unbelievable change around, really. 
The Bronco had 26, 2, and 5, while Shea had 24, 5, and 8 with two steals. Shea, disappointing. This is not a bad game, but let me explain. One of the things I talked about in the offseason, which whenever you draft somebody in the first round, there's always going to be a, a, but what if? But what if this happens? And my thing with Shea was he jumped up 10 percentage points on his free throws and had like five extra attempts at the line. And that's really what drove him through the roof. I said, well, what if him being an 81% guy every year until he was 91 last year, what if that doesn't hold? What if the free throws fall back down? Where does he end up now? He supplemented that by doing you know, three steals a game to begin this season. But the free throws aren't that. They're not that high. They have been actually pretty negative over the last like month. And he was five of 60, which is not, it's not terrible, but it's not that elite level, which is dragging him down. He is now, he was first for the season for a long time. He's third now, and he is 36 over the last two weeks. Just been an interesting little change. Chesterfield Holmgren had 16, 9, and 4 with two blocks. And then Ludort, Ludorted for six points. He had six rebounds. And he took six shots and hit only two of them. We know that we don't ever mess with Lou Dort outside of the absolute, we're just taking a flyer on a bloke because he's going to play minutes, but we have no trust in his production really at all. Speaking of no trust in production, let's talk Pelicans. Actually, let's talk about someone we do have some level of trust in. That is the big fella, Zion Williamson. 29, 5, and 10. He played 39 minutes. He had three steals. He shot 59%. He went 9 of 10 from line. We talk about the negatives about drafting Zion as well. Well, he's never going to be healthy. The man misses free throws. There's no defensive stats. All he does is score with good field goals. Well, this man is just putting up numbers left, right, and center. And if you drafted him in the 50s, I think you have been relatively handsomely rewarded. And the second half of the year, we're talking about a top 10, top 15 player in categories. Assists, steals, free throws, field goals are up. He looked like out of it. To begin the year, he was bad. He just couldn't do anything. Low usage, couldn't finish. Now he's finishing all over everybody. The numbers here are, are crazy. Ken Murphy had 16 points in 39 minutes with four threes and a block. And Herbalife Jones also notched notched 16 in 31 minutes. He had some foul trouble, so Herb's minutes were a little bit lower, but he did have four assists to steal on a block. Christian James McCollum had one of the worst halves you'll ever see. I think he had zero points with one assist in the first 15 minutes of the game. Somehow he ended with 23, 6, and 5 on 33% only with four triples. But that is a massive resurrection. Let's talk about some things that weren't so good. 11 minutes for Jonas Valanciunas. Six points and six rebounds. Some might say that that is terrible. Some is me. So I did tweet this out, but I've mentioned it a couple of times. I'll just put the, the image up on the screen now. This is Darko DPM metric, and it's got Nikola Vucevic and Jonas Valanciunas on it. And look at the gigantic dips in both of these blokes' Darko production. Red line is uh, Valanciunas, blue line is Vuce. You know, I've talked about how Vooch has sucked all season as, as an on-court player. Like, he's quite poor. He does put up pretty good fantasy stats because they just, stats have to go to somebody. But the on-court production is horrible for Vooch. And Balanchunas is suffering the same fate. And they are both becoming severely, severely negative as players. And it's happening. Like, we have saw some of the drop-off already for Vooch last season. We saw a lot of the drop-off of Valanciunas. But it is really coming into focus at the moment with JV. Um, look, he played 11 minutes, didn't start the second half, never returned. And it was just all Larry Nance and Jeremiah Robinson. So you might think that was great because I streamed Larry Nance in. So that must have been good, yeah? Well, he played 33 minutes and had four points with two rebounds and a steal. So the answer is no, it wasn't good for you. It's encouraging that they go to him the minutes. It's encouraging that he played those minutes. It's encouraging they've got two more quality games this week. But his per-minute production has been putridly bad. The reason that you grabbed him was because of the schedule. And we knew the role, and we nailed that. He's just doing absolutely nothing. Like, nothing. Outside of being, like, a much better player than what Valanciunas is at this point. Also, Najee Marshall played 23 minutes. He had 7-4. and four, Assist. A steal. Like, Okay. But again, with all these Pelicans, it was just about getting the three and four nights to end last week and then the three quality games to end Saturday this week when other teams weren't playing. That's what it was about. It's about accumulation. So the Najee ones look not great. The Alvarado one, eight, three, and three is fine, but it's not great. You weren't going to get like 17 and 10 with two steals every game and just blow everybody away. The, in the end, like you make a commitment to getting the extra games in, 
You know that these are lower level players, but at least they've got a relatively secure 22 to 23 minute role. And you hope that you get one to two pop-off games in there that boosts the overall rankings up. And again, at the end of this week, I will have a look at the overall total values of these Pelicans players since the beginning of that three and four night stretch last Thursday up until the Saturday to see what the value that they actually provided with those games was versus um, you know, other players who you played on the high volume days that were on your bench and you didn't use. So yeah, not great numbers. They're not great players. But it's about consistency in role and overwhelming with extra games played, which has happened, the overwhelming with the games. There's still two more to go. So I wouldn't drop Alvarado or Marshall or Nance. Like, What are you benefiting from doing that? If you do drop one of them, what extra games are you getting in? And you might say, well, getting one game versus two of Nance of somebody else might actually be worth it. And that is absolutely possibly true. But if that guy plays on Friday with, what, 13 games on, and he's got this great production that's better than Nance. Do you actually use him? I'd say probably not. Would you use him on a Wednesday? Look, he might, but that's an individual decision you've got to make. The advantage of this, and I'm going on about this a long time because it can be hard to grasp. The advantage of these Pelicans players and these Bucks players was the fact that you would get three games on the low volume days versus some other guys that you would get zero for. Like zero. Not someone that you would start on Monday or start on Wednesday. It was getting three games versus zero. So even though Nance didn't do very much, you got something versus zero from the other guy that you wouldn't start on the higher volume days. Yes, it, it is annoying. We wish for more. But that's, that's the theory behind it. That's the, that's the idea behind it. And the idea works. Just before we go on to the next game, I think something might have happened to Jose Alvarado at the end of this one. But I can't really seem to find any information on this. There doesn't seem to be any mention from any of the beat reporters. I can't really see anything going on. That There's no update on what happened. He did leave the game with about seven or eight minutes left in the fourth quarter. But I don't know what the update is on his injury. So just I didn't mention it when we went through the Alvarado line, which was pretty, pretty solid. It was okay. But I just don't know where we're at with that. So I will update you if I do hear anything. I'm putting out some questions to some people to see what else I can find. But I just haven't heard anything. I can't actually find any information on what's actually going on, whether he's fine or what's actually the story here. So there, there's that. Let's look at the last game. This was a pretty comfortable victory in the end for the Dallas Mavericks over the old Sacramento Kings. Uh, the Kings losing on a back-to-back. Find yourself um, someone who loves you as much as the Kings love doing that. 132-96. The Mavericks win this one. Doncic only got 32 minutes because didn't need to play more. He was questionable coming into this one. 28, 11, and 6 with three steals and four threes. Kyrie was great as well. And what about the big fella, Timmy Hardaway? That's two games in a row where he's had some interesting games. He'd been putrid for a long time. But he had 26 minutes, 22 points, four threes, four assists, steal, block. Interesting. I don't think we're adding him necessarily, but he's at least back into that points and threes streaming mix. Derek Jones had an early locker room trip, but he returned eight points for him. Dan Gafford had two early fouls, and then the blowout limited him to 22 minutes. He had 10, 4, and 3, which is absolutely like totally normal production versus the like top 20 numbers he's been pulling out of absolutely nowhere to give you recently. This is fine. He's disappointing from what he had been doing before. Paul Washington Jr. had uh, a very PJ game. 14 and 13 with four threes looks very good, and then he missed both his free throws. He shot 46 from the field, and he had no defensive stats. I don't think you can have any level of trust in PJ as being an absolute must-roster guy. For some of you, sure, not a problem. But on the games that they play the rest of the week, will you start him? And if you won't, if you don't start him, you move on. I think that's a very, very simple equation. Derek Lively also chipped in with two blocks. He's a stream guy only. For the Kings, pretty disappointing. Um, Fox had 18, 5, and 3. Sabonis had 12, 11, and 9 in his 31 minutes. And Keegan Murray at least kept up some of the good shooting, 17 points on 55%. The two guys who have been struggling a little bit are Malik Monk and Keon Ellis. Monk had 10 points on 39% in 27 minutes. Now, he will turn this around at some point. The problem is you don't know when. And that's where it gets really tricky when you're in the playoffs, isn't it? Because I know he's going to get better. I just don't know that I can deal with it. Like, again, the standard thing I'm going to tell you. Look on the days that the Kings play. Will Monk be a startable guy for you? If he isn't. Is he worth holding? Is there somebody you could add from Boston? Peyton Pritchard, Sam Hauser, Atlanta, Vic Krejci, maybe. Bogdan Bogdanovich, for those of you very lucky, maybe a sneaky stream of Trent Forrest if DeJounte is out. Would that make more sense? And the same with Keon Ellis, who we 
tried to get in for defensive stats. He had zero here. He did play 28 minutes. He had 10, 4, and 2. But his production, like his production over the last two weeks, Keon, he's the 104th ranked player in 28 minutes. It's on the back of a lot of defensive work, obviously. And that's only the reason you would have him. So like, you would start him if you're just desperate for steals and you need them on the other games this week. But otherwise, no, you don't have to hold. With these fringe players, you step into larger roles. Their production is going to be very up and down. And if you just can't deal with it, you can't deal with it. You, you move on. While the pencil, Harrison Barnes. Barnesy. Seven points in 24 minutes because he sucks. He shot 30% and you absolutely jack him. Get that garbage out of here. Without any question whatsoever. Let's go now to look at the top six players of the day. No, that's I pushed the wrong button because I did say top six players of the day, but that's not what I wanted to do because I wanted to get straight in to the monstrous line of the night. And then we'll go and do the top six players of the day. So your monstrous line of the night, of course, it goes to... Anthony Davis, who had 34, 23, four blocks. Giannis wasn't far behind, but Davis does end up getting it. Your waiver wire line of the night, the best performance from someone who's available on waiver wires. And I believe currently this man is about 2% rostered, I think, maybe even less. It is Haywood Highsmith, who had 15 points with six rebounds and two steals. Like, I don't have any trust in this man whatsoever. I don't think he's going to play every night necessarily, and even if he does, he probably doesn't do this. So this is great, but I'm not reacting to it really in any way. The young gun of the night, the best performance from a first or second year player across the NBA. This guy's got this a few times this season. We're talking about the Bronco. Jalen Williams, 26 points, five assists, and a block for the Bronco. And lastly, the dud of the night. I think there's really only one way we can go with this one because this man has sucked and has sucked for weeks. And he sucked again today. He played 11 minutes. He had six points and six rebounds. And his name is Jonas Valanciunas. But you hold, because there's two more quality games, unfortunately. And you just can't get that off many other people. Although, if like someone dropped an Al Horford, you would definitely switch Valentunas for Horford. Although, I'd probably like to switch someone with zero quality games to get Horford in. So I do actually just get more games in. It's not crazy to think that Valentunas might have one random game where he plays well. Maybe it is crazy, because he's been trashed for a long time. Let's talk about those top six players as I replay the graphic from earlier on. Who were the guys today that got it done? Obviously, number one was Anthony Davis, and number two was another Lakers player, and number three was a Lakers player. D'Angelo Russell comes in at two, Austin Reeves at three, Luka Doncic at four, Zion at five, and Yanni at six, even with the one of six free throw shooting. That's how good his game was. Your top six players rostered under 50%. Number one, Haywood Highsmith. Followed by Leaky Beasley. Yes, we've rostered Leaky Beasley. Derek Jones, Rui Hachimura, Tim Hardaway, and Keon Ellis did snag in there. Not super interested in any of those guys. Again, we're just trying to look to bulk up our games played for the week in the playoffs. Um, Hardaway becoming a little bit more interesting, especially in a roto format, if you are chasing some of those points and threes type numbers. And lastly, your top six players for Yahoo points formats. Yanni did actually edge out Giggity, uh, Anthony Davis there. So Yanni at one, Davis at two, Reeves three, Russell four, Luka Doncic at number five, and then the biggest bird, Zion Williamson comes in at number six. I'm not going to do that little takeaway checklist at the end because honestly, I'm not really sure there is anything major to take away in terms of this guy has to be added. Like Leaky Beasley, sure. But then you start making decisions on your matchup and the guys available and the schedule and how your roster looks. So nothing actually overwhelmingly stands out to me there. So I'm not going to just, you know, blow smoke up your ass and tell you about all these fantastic options because if they don't exist, they don't exist. All right, that is going to bring us to the end of the show. Short one with four games on, big one tomorrow with 12 games on. So hit the thumbs up, hit the subscribe, and you'll never miss a show. Hit that notification bell as well. And if you are on audio or video, you double bang and you listen to the other one. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. So yeah.